great friend of those UCA by the by the way. Thank you, Hi Pei. Um, so welcome to this panel. It's titled Chinese Americans Entangled in the U.S. China Conflict. I'm going to make an opening statement and then introduce the panel. But before I do that, um, a reminder that there are some volunteers with cards that will be distributing them is so that you can write questions and then will be collected at the end. The last half hour will be devoted to question and answer. So the volunteers who are distributing those cards, are you in the room and can you stand up and wave? Okay, this already been distributed around the table, I'm told. So um, please feel free to pick, pick those up and then we'll around two, well, in about an hour and five minutes, we'll start picking those up. Um, so increasingly, the news headlines has been focused on the tensions between U.S. and China, a sign that the world order is shifting as China is asserting its global dominance and the U.S. seeks to hold on uh, to its geopolitical position. According to the National Security Strategy issued in December 2017, the U.S. government regards China as the leading threat, along with Russia, Iran, and North Korea. And further, the U.S. sees China's expansion as a military and economic power, boosted in no small measure to the acquisition of intellectual property, both legal and illegal. So enter Chinese Americans, in particular immigrant scientists, engineers, and technical professionals who deal with intellectual property. They've been the subject of investigations and prosecutions, debates in Congress, warnings in colleges and universities, labs, hospitals, and the news media, raising the familiar specter of the disloyal foreigner. How can they carry on with their daily lives and work as Chinese Americans in an environment where their immigrant background and connections to China, family, personal, or work related, places them and their actions seemingly at a higher risk for suspicion. To share their insights on this matter, I'd like to introduce to you um, our panelists. Um, I'll just go down the road and say their name and their title, and then go back around and let them say a few words um, about themselves. Um, we are very honored to have these very distinguished experts. Um, to my immediate left is Charles McGonagall, special agent in charge of counterintelligence division of the largest counterintelligence office, which is in New York City. Um, we have Peter Mattis. Uh, who is a fellow with Foundation and a former CIA um, intelligence analyst. We have Mark Zaid, partner with Mark Zaid LLC, um, a, lawyer, a defense lawyer and national uh, security expert. And we have Kathy Peng, who is the CEO of Global ROCS, is that right? A, uh, a, an international uh, human resources talent recruitment firm. Um, so let me start with uh, Charlie. Are there some few words that you'd like to say about your background? And I think for our audience, it would be helpful um, for them to understand what counterintelligence is. Sound? Hello? Hello. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's truly a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, thank you, Ariane, for inviting me. Uh, thank the Chinese American uh, Convention for this opportunity. Uh, I would like to just start off by telling you that uh, effectively today is my last day uh, working for the FBI. I am effectively retiring. Uh, I've accepted a position in New York City in the private sector, so I will be moving on to uh, pursue my next phase in life. So this is extra special for me uh, to share that with you today and to be here to talk about what I think are very important issues uh, that you're raising across the board. So I can speak to you from both the government side and the private sector side now. Uh, counterintelligence, what is it? Uh, today most of what I'll be talking about is going to be from the perspective of the FBI in New York City. I spent the last two years 
focused on uh, running the largest counterintelligence program in the FBI, which is in New York City. Uh, as you can imagine, with 14 million people transiting New York City every year, the threat level in New York is always at a elevated level. So uh, it is very important uh, that the FBI uh, be uh, active in combating the threats uh, that are unique to New York City and to, I would challenge, other countries around the globe. Uh, we look from the New York perspective. I will be talking from the New York City perspective uh, as we've always prided ourselves in New York as being uh, more of a global uh, uh, organization in New York just based on the benefits of having such great cultural diversity in New York City uh, and obviously our partnerships we have established around the world. Counterintelligence in New York City can be summed up as if we have, and Ariani uh, mentioned a few of the threat level countries we are dealing with in New York City in that prioritized order. We are combating the idea that foreign governments are trying to obtain uh, classified and economic related proprietary information. That is one significant priority we in the counterintelligence realm uh, are focused on combating. Why are we doing that? Because the way I look at this threat is it's both a national security threat, but more importantly, it is an economic security threat. And I think everybody in this room can agree it is very important that we protect the economic security of this country and the private sector specifically. Why? Because if we don't protect it, that means cutting edge technology and intellectual property will then be stolen misappropriated, used in a capacity that could be problematic from an economic security and national security perspective, and more importantly, impact people here in the United States who are working in the very industrial sectors where that intellectual property comes back to. That means job loss and unemployment in the United States. And really, uh, as I look at it from a national security perspective, that economic security perspective is ever so important to the FBI as we try to protect that. So I'll leave it at that for now, and I'll pass it on to uh, my colleague, Peter. Is that working? So, I'm Peter Mattis. I'm a former counterintel counterintelligence analyst at the Central Intelligence Agency. And since I've left, I've spent a great deal of time trying to think and correct some of the misconceptions that are out there about, Chinese, about the way Chinese intelligence collects and the way in which the Chinese Communist Party even thinks about sort of collection and analysis and in terms of interacting with overseas, sort of overseas communities, overseas governments, whether it's sort of thefts in the private sector or in attempts to penetrate foreign governments. And I'll just make a, a brief plug that a friend of mine and I are, are co-authoring a reference guide on Chinese intelligence that'll be out through Naval Institute Press next year. There we go, okay. I don't speak Seligman like I don't speak Chinese like Mr. Seligman does, but as a New York Jew, I can order Chinese at like the best of them. And I wish it was better food down here than what I had back home in, in New York. So you're lucky, Charlie, for that. Uh, I represent people who are being investigated by, by Charles uh, all the time, particularly though sometimes in the criminal context. Uh, although I don't do a lot uh, of that type of work, but I can recount some stories relating to that. But I primarily handle cases in the national security world in the employment context. My clients would be people like Peter at the CIA uh, who are having problems with their security clearances uh, or personnel matters under some sort of investigation, whether it's administrative or perhaps criminal. 
And in the 25 years that I've been doing that, I have encountered quite a number of cases involving Asian Americans, whether they were naturalized citizens uh, or native born here in the United States. Uh, I'll be talking about how that uh, aspect, the ethnicity, has impacted people from within the national security community, and uh, particularly in talking about points of how any of you, if whether it's yourself or your family members or friends who are trying or anticipating obtaining a security clearance, how you can go about minimizing the concerns that might arise simply because you are Asian American. Thank you. Good afternoon, Xiao Hao. Let me start to ask, how many of you have been to Silicon Valley? Quite a lot. A lot of my friends from Europe, from New York, Chicago, or any parts of the world visited Silicon Valley. They so often tell me, Kathy, wow, we see mostly Asian here. I live in a town called Palo Alto. The Chinese population is almost reached 40%. So a lot of you probably don't know, six out of 10 most valuable public companies are headquartered in Silicon Valley. Five out of 15 private most valuable companies are based in Silicon Valley. Think about Chinese workforce, it's over 30%. So what the contribution Chinese Americans bring to this country? And what examples we set for our next generation? Think about that. Now I introduce myself. <laughs> um, Kathy Penn, I have been in this country for over 20 years. I became a citizen in 1998. So my, most of my professional life are with U.S. companies. I worked for Motorola for many years, and I also worked for a high-tech startup in San Diego. So I lived in Chicago, New York, San Diego, now in Silicon Valley. You think about the talent. I was recruited to Finland, working for two years, to help Nokia to do the globalization. So after so many years in corporate America as an executive, and I realized how important to bridge the globalization. So I started doing the management consulting business, helping US companies to land in China and how to be successful in China. Also help Chinese companies land in US to be successful in US. Of course, the talent the service become very high demand service. So that's ROCKS Global stands for. We are called Results Oriented Consulting Services. So today we're talking about, you know, um, Chinese Americans between this most integrated, the two biggest economy, what are the challenges and the opportunities? Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to have a, a dialogue with Charlie here for a little bit. So thank you very much for sharing with us the FBI's worldview on China. Could you speak a little bit to how it perceives the threat inside the United States? And then we'll get into some numbers. Sure. Right now, I think the FBI's posture, uh, and I think you did a good job of laying out the priorities uh, within counterintelligence, is we have seen since 2000 a spike in activity related to the Chinese government uh, and their activities in trying to procure uh, intellectual property. And that has progressively increased. If you are familiar, and I'm sure many of you in this room are, with the 13th five-year plan that China puts out, and you study that document, which many in the FBI do, and watch that because it's a very important document for understanding the Chinese government's strategy going forward to include, by 2049, China wanting to be the center for all technological innovation going forward. These are very, very important documents and information that the Chinese government puts out. Now, 
from the FBI's perspective and the U.S. intelligence community's perspective, how are they going to get there in a mere 20 years or less? They're not going to be able to do this alone by themselves. They are going to go out and they are going to actively procure this through the theft of intellectual property. The FBI, and I'll speak from New York City where I was the special agent in charge for two years over the counterintelligence program, had a number of investigations whereby we had the Chinese government directing individuals to procure intellectual property. I think the threat from an economic espionage standpoint has actually superseded the standard of espionage and their attempts to get to national security related information. As you can imagine, New York City, as Mr. Zaid pointed out, is the city of commerce. We have Wall Street. We have many financial institutions. We have a number of uh, trading with NASDAQ, the New York Stock Exchange. It truly is the business center, in my opinion, of the United States and will continue to be. That makes it a natural target for foreign governments, not specific to China, to Russia, Iran, North Korea, countries in the Middle East, South America, who are all attempting to do the same thing. But when I try to put this statistically in check for you, China by far is the most aggressive in its attempts to acquire intellectual property born and bred in the United States. Um, thank you, Charlie. And I think there was an IP report. There's a slide on that that um, it started that you know up to 60, 80 percent, perhaps around that ballpark of intellectual theft around the world is originating out of China. So the, the volume is very high. Um, so let's turn. Let, let me actually parse out something that you you had said uh, that you had said to me earlier, which is that the threat level of a economic espionage act as compared to, say, um, military intelligence related espionage is on the same plane. Is that correct? And that's, could you speak to that? Yeah. Uh, let's, let's dig into that and unpack that a bit. Okay, when we talk about straight espionage, we talk about either the theft or compromise of U.S. classified information. When we talk about economic espionage, we're talking about the theft of intellectual property. Generally, the government does not own a lot of intellectual property. That is the private sector. So the victims of a straight espionage violation are generally U.S. government or U.S. intelligence community related agencies who possess classified information. Therefore, when you're talking about a victim of a straight espionage case, you generally you are talking about the compromise of U.S. national security classified information possessed by a government agency in the U.S. When you're talking about economic espionage, it is primarily possessed and owned by the private sector, uh, research and development labs, and those in that private sector or that make up that community. Therein lies the difference. As far as equating the two, I would say yes, the FBI treats them both very seriously. And I want to make this point very clear. In my two years and in my 23 years in the FBI, when we receive an allegation of espionage or economic espionage, I do not simply focus on the country that is the alleged government that is trying to procure it. We treat every case equally that comes into the FBI. And in my two years as a special agent in charge for counterintelligence in New York City, never once did I take an allegation and look and say, oh, this is from China. We have to put resources on this. We have to treat this differently. We have to look at this differently. We have to pad our statistics to make sure that we and the American public know we're doing something about this. I didn't care and my colleagues at the FBI did not care if the allegation was the French, the Germans, the Japanese, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea. Any allegation of espionage or economic espionage is treated aggressively. Why? 
because the victims are clamoring for action as to who did it and where is the information. And when I walk in the door to the private sector, they're not interested in focusing on, okay, uh, this country may have done it. No, they want to know how did it occur and where is the information? And can we get the information back, most important. Now, the way we run those investigations tends to be different uh, because of, on the espionage side, you're dealing with classified information. So we have policies, procedures, and protocols for handling that type of investigation, just as we do a economic espionage where case where the information is proprietary and owned by the private sector, a company, a research and development facility, an academic institution, or something of that nature. And we collaborate very closely with those victim agencies. Why? Because the FBI does not possess or own the information. They are the experts. They are the one that possess the information. They are the ones that created the information or the innovative technology that that proprietary information ties to. And therefore, we rely on their expertise to ensure that we have accurate information. Because in economic espionage, if the information is not proprietary, there is no economic, investi economic espionage investigation. Simply put, it has to be proprietary information in order for us to move forward with an economic espionage case. Just as in a standard espionage investigation, the information must be deemed classified information. If it is not, there is no espionage violation. Thank you. So, Charlie, I'm hearing you say that there's no um, dis distinction in treatment among the different countries. And I know FBI is an independent agency. At the same time, um, what I understand is that this, the National Security Strategy Plan, and then there are also pronouncements from different elected officials which suggest that China is a top, top concern. So, how inoculated is the agency from, say, political pressure, and are there goals that are Yeah, that's a very good question. I, I can say this, uh, and, and I, I don't want to answer this question and make it seem like I'm you know, undermining our, our you know, uh, political policies or things of that nature. Uh, I think there's been enough news in the media about the FBI and the scrutiny we're under right now as an organization. Uh, but I will tell you this, it boils down to in the FBI, the allegation and the sourcing of that allegation. Uh, the FBI does not come into work. I do not show up at my desk and look at what the political posture is of the day in carrying out my responsibilities to protect the assets, equities, and people of this great country. I look at what's in front of me in a factual basis and the sourcing of information that provides leads to economic or, or espionage, uh, standard espionage. Uh, I do not really get caught up in that, and I don't pay much attention to it, I'll be frank with you. Uh, as an executive in the FBI, my job is to investigate allegations uh, in the counterintelligence realm. Now, there are many factors in dealing with these allegations and investigations, and I'm happy to walk you through that, but we'd be here for a while. Uh, there is such a level of scrutiny and oversight that goes on during these investigations with multiple independent entities collaborating to include the victim, to include U.S. Attorney's offices, to include Maine Justice, the Department of Justice here in D.C. Uh, it is not singularly Charlie, the FBI in New York, an agent that has the autonomy to affect and move forward in investigating these allegations. And that becomes a very, very important check and balance, if you will, uh, in support of making sure that we are acting in a capacity uh, that is within the law and also within our policies and protocols within the U.S. government and the FBI as an organization. Thank you, Charlie. So um, returning to that uh, comparison between military-related and economic-related espionage, um, in, in 1996, there was a new law that was enacted called the Economic Espionage Act. And what that basically did was elevate a theft of 
a trade secret um, at, you know, at the state level into, a, into espionage, which is a federal crime. So I think the point I just want to tie up this conversation is that it is the U.S. deems economic espionage very, very seriously. Okay. And a lot of what is driving that is the private sector. If the private sector continues to be victim of cyber intrusions or theft at the hands of employees or foreign governments or agents of foreign governments, the private sector immediately contacts Congress, the FBI, and a handful of other institutions because they don't want to be continued victims of a compromise or theft of their intellectual property or their trade secrets. They can't. Why? Because they have shareholders to please and they want to make sure that they are a solvent organization going forward and not a victim of a continued theft of their intellectual property. They will not remain a solvent corporation if effectively they don't have controls in place and they are a victim over and over again. And they will not tolerate that, they should not tolerate that, and it's the FBI along with a handful of other agencies in the government to make sure that we're you know, uh, addressing those concerns when they have a compromise or a theft of intellectual property. Okay, so uh, returning to the Economic Espionage Act, uh, there was a study that was done by a legal scholar by the name of Andrew Kim and released by C-100 last year. And the name of this report is Prosecuting Chinese Spies, an Empirical Analysis of the Economic Espionage Act. Um, among its findings is that between um, 2009 to 2015, uh, there was a tripling in the number of cases involving defendants with Asian names, as opposed to the previous period between 96 and 2008. So um, Charlie, my last question for you before I move on to the other panelists, is what happened in 2008, um, is there an actual increase in the, in the incidences of espionage or does this reflect a prioritization of the agency's resources? It, it all comes down to a volume and activity, right? We have seen, as I said, since 2000, a spike in economic espionage related theft at the hands of the Chinese government. Uh, this is not simply something we you know, take lightly in the FBI. We have seen an increased effort, and I think if you follow what I cited earlier, what the Chinese model has been, and look at foreign direct investment, their efforts to go get cutting edge innovative technology, and I'll cite an example. If you recall, there was an earthquake in 2008 in Suchan, I believe it was. And uh, if you recall, uh, the Chinese government, at the hands of the PLA, their military intelligence arm, uh, were able to carry out intrusion activities and also had a human agent that procured from the Boeing Corporation a significant piece of intellectual property that eventually was determined to be the uh, military aircraft plans of the C-17. Now, why is that important to the Chinese government? Because if you rec recall, in 2008, the Chinese government, the Chinese military, did not have the capability to get airlifted heavy equipment up into the mountainous region to do recovery and to effect, uh, I don't know if it was search and rescue, I think it was more just recovery, and to understand what happened in that region of China without the capability of having heavy lift aircraft to get equipment up there. So what did they decide to do? They carried out a full onslaught against Boeing to obtain information, trademark, I'm sorry, uh, trade secret information from the Boeing Corporation that effectively allowed to them to create their version of the C-17, which was, I believe, the Y-2, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, a military aircraft in China. Now, what was the cost of that? when we evaluate that. When you look at Boeing, it took them 15 years to develop and to complete and to test pilot through two separate defense contractors, the C-17. With China being able to obtain that in the manner they did, 
I believe, if my memory serves correctly, and don't hold me to these dates, China was able to create the Y2 within a mere five years and save themselves probably millions of dollars in R&D that went into creating that heavy lift aircraft. Now, that's one example of a number of cases that the FBI was engaged with at that time, uh, and it goes to my point where we saw a spike in activity at the hands of the Chinese government and their efforts to procure, aggressively procure, uh, trade secrets and intellectual property from both uh, defense contractors and the private sector. Thank you. So now we're going to turn to the nub of why we're here, which is, you know, how does law enforcement agency ferret out um, the spies and not capture the innocent parties who happen to look like them in the process? Um, to that, I'm going to turn to Peter Mattis and to uh, ask him to explain a theory that had really concerned a number of us back in 1999 and 2000 during the uh, Dr. Wen Ho Lee case where uh, there was a uh, FBI analyst, uh, former FBI analyst now, Dr. Paul Moore, who promulgated a theory called the Thousand Grains of Sand Theory. So Peter, can you explain that and then your uh, views on it? Well, the Thousand Grains of Sand sort of concept of, of how China collected intelligence basically had, I think, four major tenets, if you will. The first is that it wasn't about professional intelligence agencies or professional collectors, if you will. The second was that the focus was on ethnic Chinese, whether sending Chinese abroad from, from the PRC or operating within the diaspora communities abroad. The third was that it was not about professional tradecraft. Um, that it was not exchanges for dollars, for do it wasn't dollars for documents, it wasn't the you know, putting money into a bank account, it wasn't about sort of operational tradecraft to hide a, hide a relationship. And the fourth was that economic and industrial theft was the priority and not national security information. And one of the reasons why this was so, easy, so easily caught on and spread around was because of a nice little anecdote about a beach being an intelligence target. And it was sort of the story of, well, the Russians would surface the submarine at night, a Spetsnaz team would come ashore, fill up a couple of buckets of sand, go back to the submarine and disappear before daybreak. The United States would you know, put up some satellites, put down some sensors, and you know, figure out a bunch of signatures of the sand. The Chinese, or the PRC, would simply send 1,000 people to the beach to wander off um, and sunbathe for the day, and then as they left, shake out their towels and their clothes and end up with a big pile of sand, ostensibly knowing more about it than anyone else. Now, the problem with this, just as an obvious sort of metaphor for it, is that proprietary information and classified government information is not a public beach. Um, but there are some more fundamental problems with it that I, that I have when I've taken a look at the history of, of intelligence as practiced by the Chinese Communist Party going back to 1927. And the first is that since 1927 and the surprise after the fall of Shanghai, um, intelligence within the CCP has always been a professional activity. There is no point between about November 1927 and today in which the PRC or the, or the party itself does not have a professional intelligence organ and frankly, usually more than two or three. The second is that it muddles together, when you say Chinese intelligence, things that we would never muddle together if we said American intelligence. If, if I said US intelligence, I'm sure the first things that would come to mind are CIA, the National Security Agency, the FBI, and if you're familiar with the US government, maybe a handful of others. But we'd stop it right there. Nowhere in, in the idea of US intelligence would we say the Brookings Institution, Boeing, JP Morgan, MIT. That would not be the way that we, we would understand the word US intelligence. But under the grains of sand concept, Chinese intelligence included all of that. It was any activity by any Chinese actor, entity, whether they were you know, six generations removed from China or whether they were someone who was a government official operating as an intelligence officer abroad. 
what I think is, is quite important about what was seen is that this isn't actually one set of activities. It's that there are, there are multiple professional systems all involved in, in the Chinese system. So the Ministry of State Security is an important actor, but it's not the only one. They focus on traditional espionage targets. Yes, they do economic espionage. Yes, they are, they are involved in computer network exploitation and have continued after the 2015 agreement to steal the economic secrets. But they also do a, a number of very traditional things, recruiting sources inside the US government. And they, they function in very traditional ways because they're a traditional intelligence agency. Uh, but on the S&T side, there are a number of different places. For example, the State Administration of Foreign Expert Affairs, SOFIA. There is the Institute of Scienti Scientific and Technological Information in China, ISTIC, that has its own graduate school programs, its own professional journals, and is basically in a massive scientific library for, for the PRC. Whether you're, a, whether you're a university or a CETC or a, a state key laboratory or a company sort of deeply involved in, in military R&D. And all of, these, all of these groups are involved in the collection of information. There's also the United Front Work Department, which is mostly about mobilizing people to exercise influence. But you can see through some of the, the co-opted organizations that, that are run by the United Front Work Department, some, some overlap with the tech, technological theft. But I, I would make the point to say that there was, a, there was a period where Chinese intelligence had recruited mostly recently departed people, sort of first or second generation emigrants from the PRC. But this wasn't necessarily because they prioritized it or because that's what they were trying to do. One of the things that's not really known is that between 1927 and 1983, the creation of the Ministry of State Security, they had the three purges of their foreign intelligence collectors. So they literally, quite literally, killed off most of their expertise, or purged most of them. So should we really be surprised that people that grew up uh, inside the PRC were mostly police officers, mostly didn't have foreign language training, mostly didn't have professional intelligence tra tra training? Should we be surprised that they did their best work with people that spoke their language and that, that understood the PRC environment from which they came? It wasn't for lack of trying, because there are a number of, you know, I can, I can only say this from my experiences, there were plenty of open cases from the late 70s and early 80s, and all through the 80s and 90s, where the effort and focus was not on Chinese Americans. Thank you both. So if you can appreciate the concern about this theory is that it then implicates Chinese Americans who knowingly or unknowingly may be in, um, intelligence collectors. So what I learned just recently and happily, um, may I add, is that this theory is no longer in use by the FBI. And if you could tell us then what has um, moved into its place. I, I won't be able to go into a lot of details as to what has gone in its place, but I can assure you that the FBI is not using that as a principal means by which we evaluate uh, a counterintelligence investigation. Uh, you know, as I think Peter pointed out, that is quite dated from the days of uh, Dr. Lee uh, and the investigation, uh, which was in 1996 uh, or seven. Sorry, uh, and uh, we have gone, we have progressed, and I and I use sort of the analogy of this or the comparison. If you remember, prior to 2001, um, where you know, we had the horrendous and tragic attacks of 9-11, the FBI was postured in a way where we were ill-prepared for that type of threat. From both a organizational and cultural standpoint, and what do I mean by that? I think a lot of our workforce at that time was not overly familiar or educated culturally in the realm of the Muslim faith or what a terrorist was or how we would define a terrorist. And I'm not making the comparison to the Chinese
Chinese culture to Al Qaeda or the Muslim faith. What I'm saying is from an organization, we have progressed. And what do I mean by that? Prior to 9-11, our counterterrorism division was one-tenth the size it is right now. Today, we are, I think, from a progressive organization that learns, that educates itself, that provides ample cultural and religious training when you're talking about such a threat, uh, it's important to understand that we evolve like any organization. We invest in training. Organizationally, we progress to the point where we understand this. Why? Because if we are the organization as the FBI that is leading the threat, leading and addressing the threat of terrorism, we have to understand it. We don't know everything all the time overnight. We progress as an agency. And just as we look at the China threat, we continue to progress. And how do we progress? We progress through experience. We, we, we progress through outreach. Uh, I spend an inordinate amount of my time, or I did, in New York City in sort of town hall settings like this, where I would make appearances in the general public. Why? To garner cooperation, to garner understanding, to educate both the general public and myself as to what concerns were out there in the general public, just as we're doing right now here. I think as an organization, and for you sitting here with me, this is what I mean by progress and the evolution of progress uh, in understanding uh, mutually what the FBI is concerned with, what we're looking at from a threat perspective, and more importantly, I think it gives you perspective on the FBI and what we're doing uh, as far as addressing these threats and the approach we're taking uh, in, in addressing these threats. Thank you, Charlie. Since you mentioned community engagement, I just kind of want to skip ahead and talk to, about that a little bit. Um, so post 9-11, there was engagement between the, uh, the Muslim, Sikh, South Asian, Arab communities and um, different law enforcement agencies. And you know, what are some best practices um, that you think could be employed and could be applied here for example, I was just kind of curious about um, the way that some things have been rolled out. I mean, we get notices about things like the Thousand Talents program through prosecuted cases, um, through proposed legislation, but then I don't feel like um, the community was put on notice in any sort of way that this was a, a program that was deemed problematic. So why not a kind of graduated um, public campaign and outreach uh, is it for lack of liaison or just uh, people are very busy or can you kind of explain that? Sure. You know, it's difficult to address that, but I'll, I'll try to unpack it a bit. It, you know, the bottom line for the FBI is engagement. We, we have to have continued engagement. A couple best practices, Ariane, I can cite is uh, Director Ray and before that Director Comey and even before that Director Mueller had created Asian, the Asian American uh, council within the FBI. And what was that set up to do? It was basically uh, an organization or a board of Asian Americans that are employed by the FBI bringing forth issues from the Asian community uh, where he, they would help the director and help the organization understand the concerns of the Asian community and how to deal with those going forward. And then more importantly, the messaging in response to that. We also do that in other cultures, as you said, post 9-11, we did that in the you know, uh, Muslim communities. We've done outreach in those communities. And it goes to the point I made earlier. The organization will only evolve as you evolve with us. And we need to continue the dialogue like we're having right now, where we hear your concerns, we try to address, address those concerns, and we educate ourselves as an organization you know, to do better. The organization is not perfect. I don't know that many org organizations could claim that they were perfect. But I think through this continued engagement, both in the private and public sector, we get better together. We understand each other better. You understand the FBI's motivations and what our priorities are and how we go about doing business. Um, clearly, there's some limitations with that. But I think these dialogues and getting out more into the public 
uh, is very important. And I'll, I'll cite sort of an example. In my world, counterintelligence with Mr. Zaid and, and Peter are, are very you know, familiar with, I wouldn't make a lot of public appearances. I just wouldn't. The nature and scope of the work and the material I was handling over my 23 year career, generally I would not be making public appearances. But it goes to the point I'm making now. I'm sitting here before you as an FBI executive who's retiring, um, having discussions about the realm of counterintelligence when historically we would rarely do this. So when I speak to that evolution, I speak to that collaboration, I speak to outreach, this is exactly what I'm talking about. And we need to continue to do more of that. Uh, and I'm gonna make one more plug for the FBI. Right now, we have a 4% Asian American population employed by the FBI. Oh, wow, was right. It is too low. So, you know, how do we diversify more within the FBI? You know, we have to have this dialogue in support of recruiting the talent that is in the Asian American community to work in the FBI and the intelligence community. And how do we go about doing that? Through outreach, through, I, I heard Ms. Peng talk about, you know, the populace being 40% out in San Francisco or Silicon Valley. We need to start getting into the academic institutions out there and recruiting appropriately. Because as we address global threats at the FBI, we need to be a global organization and we need to diversify. And I know that is very important to our current director, Director Ray, and to many executives in the FBI. And I really think that that will aid us in dealing with some of the issues that are being raised today here uh, for this panel. Thank you. I have a question for Mark. Um, there's a ages-long tension between national security and um, civil rights and liberties. much so. So what I always say, and, and as Ariana just said, you know, we have the saying here in the United States of, you know, we'd rather have 100 guilty people or 99 guilty people go free and want, than one innocent person be jailed. It's very much flipped on inside the national security community, and especially since the last five years in particular with respect to insider threats because of Edward Snowden, uh, Chelsea Manning, and, and even uh, the Navy Yard shooter, Aaron Alexis, as an insider threat as well. And, you know, don't, there shouldn't be any shock that those three people in particular, though none of them have anything to do with uh, Asian Americans, have very much impacted the Asian American community because the insider threat programs that have escalated or enhanced with inside the agencies are virtually walking on on eggshells. Everything that happens raises a concern. Any suspicious behavior, even innocent, can raise a concern. And when you have a particular population, whether it's Asian Americans, individuals tied to the state of Israel, whether Jewish or not, Russians, anyone from the Middle East, anything that someone within those communities may do that raises a suspicion puts them up to the forefront. And in the national security, security clearance world in particular, uh, where there's a, a great deal of scrutiny of Asian Americans, because there are so many, I don't know the statistics by way of numbers, but you know, from uh, those that work in the national laboratories, the, those that work on defense contracting, or engineers, scientists, obviously a large population or percentage of Asian Americans. Uh, doesn't make a difference whether or not you were born here or you emigrated here. 
you undoubtedly have ties back home. And it's those ties that create the concern. Uh, here in the United States, we are totally allowed to have dual citizenship. It's, it's allowed by law, and it's absolutely allowed in order to have a security clearance. You have to be an American citizen unless there's an exception. But dual citizenship is not disqualifying because it's not you who's being suspected of any particular action. It's the country at which you are uh, related to. And that threat goes up depending on that particular country. Now, with respect to Asia, it's not just the PRC as a potential enemy. It's Taiwan. Uh, it's other allies that engage predominantly in economic espionage. Uh, the way I always interpreted the thousand grain of sand theory was not that it, it put greater pressure on how the Chinese, uh, Chinese population, but the difference between how China engaged in espionage versus how the Soviet Union, Russia, and the United States. Soviet Union, Russia, and the United States were much more brute force. Let's go in, let's steal the document, let's recruit someone as an insider, which certainly the Chinese have, has done as well, more in the contracting world, I think, uh, at least from what I understand from, and recall. But there was much more, we have a saying called the mosaic theory, which is that you have five unclassified documents, and if you put them together, it creates a classified document. Russia wants to steal the one classified document. The Chinese would go out and try and obtain all this unclassified information and put the pieces together. That's why a lot of academics in the non-security world or as contractors to the United States agencies, especially in the national laboratories with the Department of Energy, were always uh, under suspicion, like with Dr. Wen Ho Lee at Los Alamos, and I used to represent the intelligence uh, chief out there actually, who worked with Dr. Lee, that the Chinese would engage, as a Chinese nationals, would engage with these scientists who aren't schooled or as skillful as those who work in the national security establishment and would engage in conversations and build up this information that would allow the Chinese to, over a longer period of time, uh, since they've been around for they've been around thousands and thousands of years versus our, our hundred, hundred years for the Soviet Union, Russia, or 200 plus years for the United States. Uh, so, and because of threats like that comes what we just circled back around to start with this notion of when there is a concern, the establishment goes by anything that could be a likely threat to the United States. Criminal prosecutions, as everybody's been watching the Kavanaugh Supreme Court hearings, as to you know, discussions of this is a trial, what's the burden of proof? It's a, it's a nomination hearing. There is no burden of proof. It's whatever the senators want. In criminal cases, yes, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. In civil cases, we talk about more likely than not, or uh, a certainty, which is about, let's say, 75%. With national security, it's... 50.0000001%. If it tilts towards the United States, that's where it has to go. So if there's any type of concern or threat, the decision's going to be deference for the United States. That's why a lot of people end up having a lot of problems. Even though there's no real hard evidence, there's just suspicions. And if there is even a concern, like the fact I have a recent client who lost his security clearance, he emigrated here from the PRC in 1984. Uh, he's about 60. He's been here for the majority now of his life. But he goes back and forth to China to visit his elderly father, who's like 96 years old. He has a bank account there because it's a lot easier to have money in the, national, in the local currency than to have to exchange it. He may sometimes send money back. I'm sure this probably applies to a ton of people out there because you're doing the right thing to help your family. And all of these actions create a potential threat to, not that the, that action is a threat to national security, but potentially gives that country, in this case PRC, some possible leverage over you that they can threaten your family members, that they can threaten you when you go uh, visit there, that they could potentially uh, take your bank accounts or your real estate property, whatever it might be. 
And any one of those types of threats means that the United States would rather have 99 innocent people lose their security clearance than the one guilty person be able to disclose classified information like Ed Snowden did. Thank you. At this time, I want to ask for a time check because I don't have my phone with me. be doing Q&A now? Okay, um, so can we get maybe about 10 more minutes and then while we're collecting cards? Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna start jumping around. Oh, okay. Oh, oh thank you, thank you. Um, okay, Kathy. States and, and China. And so you were sharing with me that there's um, movement among top talent. Can you explain why um, a Chinese American would want to go to China to uh, seek employment or start a company? And are they aware of these, um, these issues? Yeah, good question. As we all know, U.S. and China are very much integrated. There are so many opportunities between two countries for top talents. And you'll be surprised at how many Chinese nationals are hired in Silicon Valley or in the States. They are not even educated in U.S. So when you look at Google, Apple, Facebook, there are a lot of Chinese nationals working there, they, they recruited out of China. And of course, at the same time, so many US companies enter in China want to be very successful in China, right? Apple as an example, and Google is re-entering China, and Facebook wants to get back in China, there's Qualcomm, Intel, so many companies. So those companies will recruit top talents to work in China. So that's for US companies. At the same time, Chinese companies, most of them going global, they also want the talents from around the world. So in Silicon Valley, that's the center of the universe in the high tech space. And very often we see most the talents, they have multiple offers from different companies for both US and China. So when you face the opportunities, there's certainly some challenges. So, um, which is the challenge I think we discussed on the panel. Um, since the time is limited, so I save it for the Q&A. Thank you. Okay, so one of the things we wanted to do with this panel was to make sure that people had some practical um, takeaways as to what they are permitted to do and what they're not permitted to do. Um, so, Depending on the, the, the panelist, it may be, for example, Kathy, you have advice that you would give to um, an employee, or if we had an IP um, attorney here, they would give some advice. In fact, I think I've got a slide up from um, Nelson Dong, uh, which would have had some guidelines. Um, but Charlie, in terms of these foreign talent exchange programs, which has been in the news recently, um, most pointedly the Thousand Talents programs, I think one of the things that I had asked you was whether there was a list of programs so that people have fair notice about programs that the U.S. deems um, problematic and that they can steer clear with because people are trying to figure out how they can, um, you know, make a living but yet completely steer clear of, of trouble. Yeah, I, to, to try and articulate lists of organizations for you that are tied to the Chinese government would be quite long, to be honest with you. But, you know, the talent programs are utilized as a matter of routine for directing individuals to procure or get into positions, whether it be in the academic realm for R&D, the scientific community, or uh, at worst, as we've seen over the years, obtain positions with the U.S. Department of State or somewhere in the intelligence community. So the Chinese government is aware of these exchange programs. They utilize them. Uh, they place people into them. Uh, and they also, uh, as best as I can tell you, is 
Uh, when you're talking about the Chinese Communist Party and the policies and the government, they are going to use every vector possible to place individuals in positions whereby they can get access to information of interest to the Chinese government. And that's both from a national security perspective and also an economic security perspective. Thank you. Any advice, Peter, you might have? In one sense, I think Beijing has actually made it a little bit easier now to know which ones you should stay away from, um, particularly at least on the technology side. It would be anything associated with the Qi Xiao Di, the Seven Brothers universities, which includes Harbin Institute of Technology, Harbin Engineering University, I think Northeast Polytechnic, and there are a handful of others. But those schools are essentially almost like a national lab in the United States, except for within their, only their classified portions. Because they, are doing, they do primarily research for the PLA. In some cases, like the Harbin Engineering University, it was run by the PLA for many years before switching over to the Ministry of Education and then ultimately to MIIT. So s those are places to, to steer clear of. The other, the other piece that's out there is um, Junmin Ronghe, the military civil fusion. It's been made very, very clear that, th that a lot of civilian research and technology development is going to be fed directly into the PLA. And most of the civilian organizations and outfits and, and talent programs that are involved in this are, they proudly identify themselves as being a part of these programs. So it's, it's, it's really about making sure that you know with whom you're dealing and trying to look back a step or two with what that organization is, whether it's a company, whether it's a university, is it connected to, is it connected to an, a state key laboratory for national defense? Um, and that would be sort of a baseline, a baseline rule of, of who to stay away from. Um, I mentioned a couple of them already so I could get that sort of out there. And these, this guidance applies, frankly, to regardless of the country, even some of our allies, as I said. So if you have connections to foreign nationals overseas, relatives or friends, and it's a very difficult situation because sometimes, frankly, you, you have to make a choice. And the government's not asking you to make the choice. They're just indicating that this is what's going to raise concerns. So the less contact you can have, the better. And I, and I hate giving the advice when my clients say, can I go? I've had clients not go back to the funerals of their family members, their parents, because of the concern if they went back to Russia or if they went back to China, how the government would look at it, especially if they currently held a security clearance. And it's a horrible position to be in, but it's just the reality of how the government is looking at it now. So uh, not having any inheritance. If you have siblings, you transfer the inheritance over to them. Not traveling back, not speaking, or at least minimizing. Everything in the security clearance world is about mitigation. So if you have contacts with your family members, we just have to mitigate the concern. How, what would be some examples? Don't discuss what you do or your family member does here in the United States. So that we could always say, yes, you know, I talked to my mom. She's 84 years old. She doesn't speak any English. She just calls to find out how I'm doing and how, more importantly, how the grandkids are doing. And we never discuss what work I do. She has no idea where I work and she has no idea I have a security clearance. That type of evidence would minimize some of the concerns that would exist. When you're here in the United States, sort of like what, what Mr. Seligman was talking about, how the, the one individual that he wrote the book on wanted to integrate himself to be an American. The US government looks at that as well. Again, in any country. I had happened to be Asian American. He was from South Korea. And in his office, one of the ways we got him his security clearance back was in his office, he had, this is about 10, 12, 15 years ago, he didn't have any pictures of the South Korean leadership or anything. He had a picture of President Bush and Vice President Cheney. He was the only one I knew who had a picture of President Bush up in his office. 
But he had American flags everywhere. Or I often say to Indian Americans who I represent, if I walked into, I always ask their friends, if I walked into that person's house, what would I see? Do I see, is it like going to you know, a, a city or a town in India? Do I, do I smell Indian food? Or am I walking into what would just be a normal American home? Again, no requirements and no one's asking in the United States for anyone to give up their culture or their background, but these are at least pointers that, from a practical standpoint that would minimize the concern that the U.S. government would have if you were going to hold a security clearance or even if it's your family member because you will impact your potential family member. If one of your kids is now at Stanford and, and going to go work for a national laboratory and they were born here and, and they're as American as, uh, as American be, in fact, not and I think, I think this is horrible, actually, not teaching your kids your native language, which really is terrible, but is something to then show to the U.S. government that, uh, that you weren't trying to engage in perpetuating your foreign ideology or loyalty. It's a very dual-edged sword, and I imagine uh, most people who work inside the national security community are really conflicted by this. But unfortunately, it's the reality of the way the system is at the moment. As I mentioned earlier, we are proud Americans. We hold the values very high. So what we can do to protect ourselves instead of be, you know, reactive, we have to be very proactive and also advocate. I'm very proud every single of you to come here. But we need to get more people involved in the community and have a conversation like use this panel. It's wonderful to have a conversation. We have to have the knowledge. And we have to find ways to enjoy all the equal human rights and all the rights we have as Americans. So um, I really encourage every single of us to continue to serve and to inspire and to lead. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna, can you hear me now? Okay, is it working now? Okay, good. So uh, we've received a number of questions from the audience, thank you very much. So I'm going to um, summarize or tease out uh, certain elements of, of the questions. Um, High among people's concerns, um, Charlie, is that a, a, a certain number of high profile cases, and this is where it goes back to the idea that um, Chinese Americans are caught in the crosshairs. Um, the idea that there's a dragnet and then inevitably there's some collateral damage, right? Um, and the cases involve that I'm thinking of specifically has to do with Dr. Xiaoxing Shi, who was a, a physics dean at Temple University. He lost his job as a uh, result of the um, charges leveled against him, um, which were later dropped. But he also incurred hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees and um, lost to his reputation otherwise. In that case, the uh, design that was involved uh, was not what the FBI office, and it, I, not your office, um, but the one in Pennsylvania, it, they had completely mistaken the science. So it kind of brings to question to um, what levels of review, um, you alluded to this, but if you could go into that a little bit more specifically, and is there a subject matter expert with a science background, and where does that person play into the process? I think it would be inappropriate for me to comment on another field office's investigation. I think we should look at the bigger issue here, right? Okay. In that investigation, what can be done as we look to learn from this and that can override the concerns? Obviously, in any economic or straight espionage investigation, at its core, we rely on, as I touched upon earlier, experts 
in the area where that information is developed. Because the first question I want answered is, is the information classified? Yes or no? And what level of classification is the information? And who is the classifying authority in that organization that can testify in a proceeding or tell me as an FBI agent that the information is classified, it's been classified for this long, this is the classification level it's at. Now on the other side, in the economic espionage realm, my first question is, the information is a trade secret, correct? Yes or no? How long has it been a trade secret? Who developed the information? If the answer to that question is no, there is no investigation of a theft of a trade secret. And yes, the FBI relies on the academics, the researchers, the engineers who developed that, and more importantly, the individual that can stand up and definitively tell you, whether it be in an FBI interview or if it is uh, a criminal proceeding, the nature, scope, the R&D, and the fact that that is a trade secret. There has to be that level of definitive um, confirmation in support of moving forward in that type of investigation. Uh, I don't know all the facts in this investigation. I was not part of this investigation. I don't know where the uh, deficiency was in, I am familiar with where the deficiency was, you know, from a distance, uh, that they didn't have a definitive read on the trade secret, and it turned out to be schematics from another, uh, you know, uh, I think, uh, product within that organization. But how they got to that point, why they didn't know that early on, I can't answer that. And I, it would be inappropriate for me to comment on that. But just know that definitive nature uh, of the information is ever so important before you progress. And when you're working with the U.S. Attorney's Office or an assistant United States attorney, they know that at its basis that has to be established immediately. Um, thank you. Uh, there, there are dozens of cases where um, the defendants did plead guilty. And so the focus, um, which brings the highest concerns, are those ones where, um, like, like Dr. Shee's, but there are a, n a number of cases where it appears that the, the charges ultimately become, for lack of a better word, low level. Um, but yet they're, they're characterized in the media as being espionage related. So I'll just spell out what the concern, and I'm just guessing here, that, that the concern is that, that ethnic profiling is occurring and targeting Chinese Americans, and then without the evidence servicing to support that charge, um, that then the law enforcement is finding what it can find. So it may not be specifically um, trade theft related, it might be um, wire fraud, it might be falsifying a, a false statement, it might be um, receiving money um, overseas because you're moonlighting or something like that. And I think the concern is that, that, they're being, that the targets are being squeezed and made an example of because they're, they're part of this group that is deemed to be culpable. As far, as far as ethnic targeting or uh, the FBI in conducting an investigation, I touched on this earlier. I do not look at allegations of espionage or economic espionage uh, specific to what country does the potential uh, suspect or subject hail from. I, that is not something that routinely is discussed in the FBI. It is is. It a theft of intellectual property or is it a compromise of U.S. national security information and who's responsible for it? Uh, as far as us, the FBI, singling out the Chinese, uh, the uh, American Chinese community, I would say that is just not something we are doing as a matter of principle within the organization. It is the activity by which we are making decisions. It is evidence that we have in support of you know, moving cases forward in the prosecutorial realm. 
the ethnic makeup of a subject is not something that is a tenant either within the criminal prosecution uh, arena or the FBI investigator arena that rises to a level of us making decisions on moving forward or how seriously we treat an allegation. Now, as far as charges, okay, and Mr. Zaid is well aware of this, I'm sure, uh, when we look at a case, we open investigations, and it could be an economic espionage case, and this goes to the earlier point I was making. Economic espionage cases, in principle, are very difficult cases to make for a number of reasons. And we touched upon that. Is it a trade secret or is it not a trade secret? Is there good evidence to show this individual is responsible for the theft of that trade secret or not? Now, in the course of any FBI investigation, and I would say that this is not unique to economic espionage or espionage, we may start an investigation into the violation of money laundering. But if we do not develop the evidence that supports a money laundering charge, we, in the course of investigation, may identify other evidence of other crimes that the U.S. Attorney's Office and the FBI will move forward in charging. Now that, again, is not based simply on the ethnic makeup of the individual. It is made up of the evidence we have identified and secured in the investigation. So it's one thing to open an investigation in something. It's another thing to charge criminally a violation that you have evidence for. And that happens every day in the FBI. Thank you. So I have a question for Mark here. Um, the, the question is... There, there are cases, uh, rare though they are, uh, that I'll have with France uh, in Italy. Um, you generally will never see, although every once in a while I, I do have one, involving what we call the, the, the five eyes with us being one of them. So England, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. I actually had one Canadian case where the guy owned half a brewery in somewhere in Canada and somehow that was a security threat. Uh, that went away very quickly though. Uh, but it really goes to the engagement of countries involved with espionage uh, against us. And there's some studies, uh, one is called PERSEREC. What's it stand for? Personnel Security something, right? Uh, it, it's I always describe it, is it fully government or it's more like RAND? It's RAND. It's similar RAND. RAND. So it, it's in California, if I remember. So if you look at P-E-R-S-E-R-E-C, -E 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 all capitals, if you Google it, you'll come up with, with reports that this uh, organization does for the U.S. government, and it tracks espionage activities over the, over the decades. And you'll see, in fact, espionage has changed dramatically in the last 20 years. You know, it used to be... And, and frankly, a lot of what happens today is still governed by Cold War mentality. Uh, every time there's an espionage case, the U.S. government tracks it, categorizes it, assesses who the person is, what traits are common among that person. Did they walk the dog every day at 9 o'clock in the morning? Well, if they did and we find another person who did the same, maybe that means they're more likely to be a spy. And they'll just literally track everything. So if you look at it historically, people with alcoholism, people with gambling problems, financial problems, people with ties back home to the home country, I'm talking decades earlier, these were people who were much more likely to be spies out of the general population. People who were homosexual and could be blackmailed back in the day. Uh, nowadays, it's much more ideological that has been seen. It's less about money. Uh, it's become a much younger group of people. Uh, literally, I mean, they go by gender, age, you name it. So you just don't see it from as much in the European countries. I mean, that's just plain and simple. But again, to emphasize, you know, very close allies. I will sort of sh shake myself when a new client comes in the door when they tell me the country in question is Israel which is one of our closest allies, as much as if it was someone coming in and saying they have family in Afghanistan or Pakistan. Because Israel's espionage program is so aggressive against us that it raises sometimes more difficulty than if I have a PRC or Taiwanese case. Thank you. This question is for um, Kevin.
Kathy. Um, how, how is the uh, issue of the glass ceiling for Chinese Americans handled? How would you address that? Or how could it be addressed? So the glass ceiling is a very heated topic across the US. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, as a workforce, I use uh, Silicon Valley as an example. Uh, when you talk about the top positions, you don't see many Chinese Americans. And why is that? I think this is a very um, long topic to discuss. But there are a few reasons. And the Chinese typically have like, naturally be entrepreneur. So you can see in Silicon Valley, um, NVIDIA, Marvell, uh, Yahoo, all founded by Chinese and become huge corporations. Um, although, of course, you have you know, Chinese bigger companies opportunities. So when you hit the ceiling, you cannot uh, advance. So you're looking for different opportunities. And start your own company is a natural way because uh, you know, our heritage is to be more entrepreneurial. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, as a community, if we come together to advocate our rights, and also how to advance career in the corporate America. This, I have been doing this for past 20 some years in the US. It's together, how we have mentors, how we set examples for next generations, how we break the glass ceiling to be top executives, to be CEOs, to be board members, so how to come to the table. I think that's one of the issues, opportunities we work on at UCA and many other organizations. Thank you. Um, Charlie, this, this question relates to FBI Director Ray's um, statement during a congressional hearing earlier this spring, um, where he said that there was a um, whole of of uh, society threat coming from China, which warranted a whole society response from the United States. Can you explain um, this term, whole of society? Yes, and this is my interpretation of what Director A testified to. I'm not going to try to second guess what Director A's comments were. Like you interpreted it, I interpret it this way. The Chinese government will use any means possible to collect and to ascertain information, whether it be national security information or proprietary trade secret related information uh, for and on behalf of the Chinese government. That means they are using a whole of government approach to do this. I think the societal interpretation was uh, and I'm, I'm not you, so I'm not going to pretend to interpret this for you or what you understood, but you felt that every Asian American in the United States is engaged in some act of espionage based on that comment or your interpretation of it. I did not interpret it that way. I think it was interpreted as a, in a way that said the Chinese government is aggressively using any means necessary when it looks to collect that type of information. So Director Ray was actually quoting from a speech that Xi Jinping gave last year in terms of mo that he, Xi Jinping said we must mobilize a whole of society effort to pursue the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. And that means it's not just about espionage, it's not just about economic espionage, it's about, it's about mobilizing diaspora communities as political props. It's about control of external propaganda and shaping Chinese language media abroad. It's, it's pretty much anything that you see inside the PRC in terms of control being pushed out beyond the borders. Because the most important border to the, to the Chinese Communist Party is not the one of the PRC, but it's the one between the party and everyone else. And you know, it's one of those things where as a, as a private citizen, I would wish Director Ray had, had made a couple of qualifications on it to say, this is the Chinese Communist Party's policy, and it, it tries to reward and incentivize cooperation and punish neutrality or, or opposing it. Um, but he, it is something that came directly 
directly as a statement from the Chinese government at the highest levels. And it's, it's one of those unfortunate pieces, the PRC, and I think this gets to the, the issues that Mark and, and Charles have, have raised, that the PRC state is actively searching and, and pulling on these things. It's not just that these connections exist, it's that the PRC itself or the, or the Chinese Communist Party actively goes out and tries to pull on those, those connections to exploit them. I think that's one good segue to mention one major piece of theft that involves the Chinese government, at least by perception and everything with national security, is that the OPM breach, the, the breach into the Office of Personnel Management. Any one of us who, have a, who has a security clearance fills out a national security questionnaire called an SF-86, just standard form 86. It's 127 pages. I teach people how to do it all the time. It's the, pre, the operative document that the U.S. government utilizes to decide on whether to grant a security clearance to people. It has very personal information, you know, pr uh, sensitive uh, information like sec social security numbers, but also information that can be used against someone like criminal history, prior drug use, mental health issues, family members overseas that you're close to, foreign government officials you're close to, and millions of these documents were stolen from OPM and the primary suspect is the government of China. Charlie, I have a question about cultural competency um, within the agency. So I'll just give you a very specific example. Um, two people on, on different sides of a table, one looking directly in the other person's eyes or averting them may be interpreted differently, right? So uh, stereotypically for an agent, you know, looking in somebody's eyes would be challenging them. But to an FBI agent, they might perceive that as not being truthful. Um, what cultural competency and ongoing efforts within the FBI exist? Um, do you have consultants? Are there trainings? How is that integrated into the practice? Yeah, in, in short, I think that is not just applicable to the uh, American Chinese community. This is across the board. So. Uh, the short answer to your question is yes, we do have cultural training. Uh, yes, we have um, a number of different opportunities to educate our workforce as to what cultural norms are acceptable and what are deemed to be um, offensive, if you will, uh, when we're carrying out our investigative activities. Uh, but let me just assure you that the basis by which we determine if somebody or we think that somebody is not being truthful is not solely based on whether you make eye contact with us in an interview or not. Uh, there are other factors that come in into an investigation uh, that the FBI utilizes to determine if somebody is being truthful. Uh, so the, the answer to the question, yes, there, are, there is cultural training within the FBI. We take that very seriously. And I touched upon sort of the 9-11 analogy uh, whereby we transform the agency into understanding those cultural norms as it related to the Muslim faith and doing outreach. We're doing the same thing in the Chinese community, and that's very important. Um, so we have about five minutes left, so I want to reserve one last question um, for Charlie, and then I'll go down the line and see if the panelists have any closing thoughts that they would like to make. Um, and, and that is taking opportunity of the fact that you did serve on the task force on the Wenho Lee case. Um, upon reflection, these past um, 20 years, are, are there some things that um, you see the FBI have evolved um, in their practices because of that case or anything else you want to share with us? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, I know that many in the audience and in the community uh, sort of look at the Dr. Wenho Lee case as uh, a real problem when it comes to, uh, you know, the Chinese American community. Uh, you know, I, I'm not going to speak specifically to that investigation. I don't know that it's appropriate for me to do so. Uh, and yes, I was a task force member f out of the New York office that participated in that uh, down in Albuquerque uh, through our Albuquerque field office. But I, I think the bigger, you know, message here is, you know, uh, we learn from every investigation as an organization. Uh, our personnel learn from every investigation. Uh, I don't know that it would be appropriate for me to comment 
on you know, the scope of that investigation and what transpired because honestly I wasn't there the entire time and I was detailed from another field office for a short period of time. Uh, there are always lessons learned. I would challenge anybody in this room that goes about their daily business and what they do for a living that we can always look in retrospect uh, to get better, to understand, to make sure that we don't make uh, you know, maybe mistakes or we take corrective action moving forward. The FBI as an organization does that uh, in every investigation. We always look back and say what could we have done better? Maybe what didn't we do that was so good? I know in New York City we would routinely look at our investigation uh, progression and look back on cases that we either didn't take to prosecution or did in support of refining our processes, uh, developing better understanding and best practices, and then applying those going forward. Thank you. So, Kathy, starting with you, I want to see if you have any closing remarks, if you could make it under a minute. Thank you. Yeah, Charlie mentioned about the lessons learned. I think this is a very critical point. So I mentioned earlier about the advocate. The awareness is very key. So a lot of people make careless mistakes because they don't necessarily understand the regulations or understand the law. Uh, it's, you know, um, Apple is a great example, you know, how to keep a IP intellectual property, and they, do you know, they prohibit employees even talk to the family members about the internal organization, the projects they're working on, and they're not allowed to speak at any public setup about anything about Apple. So we need to educate our community so we could uh, really, you know, help each other better and protect our rights. Like I mentioned earlier, you know, we wanted to be treated as Americans, right? We are very proud. We contributed so much to this country. We want to be respected, and we have earned it. It is very easy to feel as the individual or the family member when you are being suspected or accused of not being able to be trustworthy to the United States government in a security clearance standpoint or in a prosecution standpoint, to feel that there's some sort of uh, discriminatory behavior or bias towards you by your ethnicity or your religion, your race, whatever it might be. I think I could say, having done this for 25 years, I, I don't see, as a, certainly as a general rule in the United States government, any type of directed bias, whether it's ethnicity or religion or race, at, at least in the, in the context of national security. What I do see is how easy it is to slip down that slope when there is some sort of reasonable, reasonable suspicion or even suspicion. Some of it goes to what Charles was talking about uh, with having inside the agencies this education of what the cultural norms are. And that's a big, big problem here in the United States that, especially from a non-European perspective, of our inability or lack of education in understanding other cultures that are very different from ours whether it's Asian or particularly Middle Eastern. And I think the solution for that, not only is for the agencies to be uh, educating themselves and bring more people in from those communities, but also the communities to maybe go against what you would normally feel would be the suspicion towards law enforcement and instead cooperate more in the sense of educating the law enforcement. I see this particularly post 9-11 with the Middle East. Uh, one quick real example. Uh, if you've ever dealt with anyone from the Middle East, really from the Middle East, I've represented hundreds of linguists, translators, people from Iraq and Afghanistan who then went back and risked their lives for the United States. And they, they use certain terminology different than what we would. So they would always come back to me and show me letters of support that they received from the military commanders they worked with. And they would always refer to this person as my brother, my good friend, 
And it was somebody who barely knew them. It was somebody who just gave them a letter of appreciation for the services that they really rendered. But to this cultural norm in the Middle East, you would say my brother to someone who we would say is just a friend. Or you would say my good friend to someone who we would just say is an acquaintance. Hey, you know, every year you come to this conference, you see the same person, you hang out, you say hi. You're not really friends. You're just acquaintances. You're friendly. But people inside the, some of the agencies who are not from that sector don't realize that. And I had a guy lose his security clearance because he had said that one of his friends had been a bomb maker in Iraq <laughs> in a polygraph examination. The guy, he went to high school with this guy like 10 years earlier. He had not seen him in the 10 years, but he, he used this language terminology that he was used to to say it was my friend. And it ended up dooming him at the end. And I don't have his, uh, an Asian example, but I can't imagine, and I'm sure there's tons from a cultural standpoint, from the Western use of terminology is just completely different. And there's, because there's only 4%, at least in the FBI, that we lack that ability. So I, I actually, even though I'm an outsider, I've never worked for the federal government, I sue them all the time. Both of these agencies, constantly. Uh, you know, I see the deficiencies and, and the harm that happens from both sides. And actually, I would encourage more panels like this where you have representatives of the FBI and former agency to have that type of dialogue because it's really important. So, I guess my, my parting words would be we're in the middle of, of a a really substantial change in U.S. policy toward China, the most substantial since 1972. And there are a number of ways to, to frame it, but this recalibration is taking place in Australia, New Zealand, Japan, any of a number of other places. And in the past, the sort of the policy and the encouragement from the government was sort of engage, 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 and not necessarily think about the consequences. And now there's much more of an explicit risk idea that risk needs to be managed. And one of the reasons why I think there's, why there have been so many sort of PRC related economic espionage cases or tech transfer or export control violations is simply because the state links are easier to see. And this is one of, this is where I would go to, to reiterate that point of know with whom you are dealing because there are so many ways now in which, in which Xi Jinping's China has made explicit that even civilian organizations are serving the military, are serving the state in explicit ways. That's not just because this university is run by the Ministry of Education, but that it has a, a specific role in supporting the PLA or supporting sort of the development of technology that if you were to try to export it from the United States to the PRC, it simply wouldn't be legal, um, but you might have it might be possible to do it in a, in a cooperative research agreement. It's also worth noting that I think China has the longest denied entities list. And the unfortunate thing, when, if you go through this list, you'll see parts of big companies. So you'll see a couple of research labs connected to the China Electronics Technology Group Corporation, CETC. But what you should take from that is just because a subsidiary is listed, it doesn't mean the rest of it is necessarily okay. And you want to have a, a much clearer picture of what these, you know, either starting from that, say, denied entity and going up to its parent corporation or starting from it and going down to its, to its supporting companies. Because there are very, very clear ways in which you can see how, how policy and theft are developed. You know, Hu Jintao made a, a number of speeches incorporated into a party congress work report about food security. Hu Jintao went to Da Nong. In, in Beijing and said, this is a company that is on the forefront of, of providing food security. Da Nong created a sort of front organization inside the United States. You may have read about the Robert Moore case. And you can see the theft of, from that company of trade secrets from LG and Monsanto. And it just means that if you're not thinking about what these companies are doing, how do they link into a, to a five-year plan how do they link into a thousand talents programs or the different high-tech modernization programs, you can find yourself bumping into something that raises a red flag, even if it's not a full investigation. It could mean legal fees. It could mean something quite 
unnecessary and unpleasant. Great. I just want to uh, take this opportunity uh, to thank you all for the opportunity to be here today. This was, uh, I thought, an excellent panel with excellent uh, representation. Uh, as far as uh, some closing comments here, I, I would encourage, and I think uh, Mr. Zay touched on this, uh, I think these outreach efforts need to continue in the major cities where we have a large Chinese-American population. Uh, I think in New York we would welcome this opportunity to do that uh, moving forward. Uh, I would also put the um, sort of uh, ideas into your head to you know, uh, engage a little more on your end of the FBI. Uh, I don't know how many of you in this room have had engagement uh, in a public realm with the FBI. I, I think we need to be doing more of that. Uh, I think you need to understand what the Chinese intelligence services are uh, doing and how they're operating and what they're asking individuals to do. I think educating yourselves, uh, to Peter's point, uh, is very important. Uh, and you know, we have to get beyond this fear of contacting the FBI or law enforcement. Uh, simply put, you know, I, I think having contact or having the ability to contact the FBI becomes ever so important in resolving the issues we've sort of discussed today. If, if we want collaboration moving forward, you need to feel free to contact the FBI and know that you're not going to be simply persecuted because of your ethnic background. Uh, I think town halls, that, that opportunity, and really uh, through a recruiting and potential employment opportunity, I would encourage Asian Americans to seek employment with the FBI. Uh, because where are we going to be in 10 to 15 years? I think to Peter's point, we are entering in an economic realm with the trade situation and other economic factors which are going to really uh, challenge uh, U.S. foreign policy with China. And it's, you know, the impetus is both on you as, an organiz as a, a, a cultural or, uh, uh, part of our population and also the U.S. government in bridging that gap. And we need to do that now, not 10 years from now, not 15 years. It'll be too late, in my opinion. But I wanted to thank you all very much. Uh, you've been a terrific audience, and it's really been a pleasure for me to be here today. Uh, so on that note, that's an invitation. There have been uh, local community groups um, in various cities who have contacted their regional FBI offices. Um, meetings have been held in the Bay Area, in Los Angeles, in Houston, in Austin. There are more planned for Dallas and uh, Minneapolis um, after today as well. Uh, so if you would like to know how to contact, you can, a, a, a regional office, we can put you in touch with somebody who's maybe done that before. Um, I do want to thank the FBI for responding positively to those requests for meetings and also especially to um, Charlie McGonagall for coming today because I think he really narrowed the gap in knowledge um, and resolved a, a number of concerns that we have and so I'm hopeful that we can continue this dialogue um, and work together with headquarters or the DC office here. I want to thank all our panelists, Kathy Pang, Mark Zaid, Peter Manis, and, and Charles McGonagall. Please give them a round of applause. Thank you also. Thank you, Ariane, for our excellent job moderating this wonderful panel. Um, you know, um, I think the sad reality is um, mind our own business is not enough. That's not an option. We need to engage. We need to uh, not only build a community within ourselves, we also need to engage with the broader society. We need to dispel the stereotypes that we don't have free agency. We are easily manipulated or controlled by Chinese government. That's simply not true. And that's incumbent upon us to demonstrate that. And with that, 
I want uh, everybody to give another round of applause for our panelists. Thank you very much. Excellent job. Thank you.